matters. An interactive program brought to you by MTA International. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to another edition of Faith Matters where you, our viewers on MTA, set the agenda by the questions you ask. Jazakum Allah and thank you for the questions you've been sending in. And just as a reminder for those of you who are not yet familiar with our email, it's faithmatters at mta.tv. That's faithmatters at mta.tv for any questions, thoughts, comments or observations you may have. Others may wish to use the fax. Well, the fax number here in the UK is 4420868737. We've had viewers write in about previous Faith Matters programs. Well, you can find these now on YouTube. Go to YouTube, put in MTA Online 1, Faith Matters and the subject you're after, and hopefully you'll find the answer just there. And if you don't find it, you know what to do. Faith Matters at MTA.tv. With that, I'd like to introduce our viewers to our very esteemed and distinguished uh, panel this morning. Assalamu alaikum gentlemen, welcome to Faith Matters. Just for our viewers' benefits in terms of a brief introduction, it's my pleasure once again to my immediate right to welcome the Naib Amir of the United States, Azhar Hanif Sahib. Assalamu alaikum and wa alaykum welcome salam. to Faith Matters once again. To his right is Ayaz Mahmood Khan Sahib. He is a graduate of the Amdi Institute of Languages and Theology, again a regular on Faith Matters. Assalamu alaikum, Yasab, welcome to Faith Matters. And to his right, again a very familiar and always a welcome face uh, to Faith Matters is of course Maulana Abdul Ghani Jahangir Khan Sahib, who's head of the French desk here in the UK. Assalamu alaikum, well, Jahangir Saab, well, welcome well, to Faith Matters. Gentlemen, we're going to start with a question from uh, Idris Yusuf Saab from Huddersfield in the UK. Assalamu alaikum, Madhuri Sahib, and Jazakumullah for your question. Um, this, Ayaz Mahmoud uh, Sahib, if I could come to you with this to begin with, it relates to, again, some of the allegations and, uh, which are leveled against not just the community, but particularly the founder of the Amdiya Muslim community, who we hold to be the promised Messiah, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed. And Idris's question, obviously, he's had discussions or he's been uh, heard these allegations, relates to the passing and the, the passing away of the promised Messiah, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed. And he asks the question that did Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, as he has heard from some of these people making allegations, die of cholera in Lahore? Could you shed some light on this? Uh, Tariq Saab, the answer to a question which has no basis whatsoever can be nothing other than no, it didn't happen like that. And this is what we often always say when this allegation is raised against the Promised Messiah There are two kinds of questions, Tariq Saab. One kind of a question is that which is academic, which is asked sincerely for the purpose of gaining a deeper insight into the religious beliefs of a person or theology or his ideologies. But then there are other allegations which are raised by our opponents specifically for the purpose of mockery and mischief. Mm -hmm. And this, and of course this is not, I'm not suggesting that the questioner is doing so out of this mischief, but the allegation which has come to him is just that. Yes, it he's, is heard a, this, he's heard this, this from other people, yeah. and our opponents often uh, spread this. And we should ask these opponents that what proof do they have? Making a mere claim without any proof whatsoever is equal to nothing. It means nothing. Mm -hmm. Now people say that the promised Messiah wasalam, died of cholera. I asked them, what is the proof of that? Do they have a medical certificate? Were they present at the demise of the Promised Messiah to say so firmly and confidently that the Promised Messiah died like this? They have none of these things to support their claim. So a claim is merely a claim. The greatest testimony of the manner or the, of the state of a person when he passes away is of those people who are present on the scene. And usually in these uh, instances, the family members of the person who passes away mm -hmm. is present there. And they go through this difficult time with their beloved before he leaves this transient world. And that was the case with the Promised Messiah wasalam, as well. His family members were there, members of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community were there, Hazrat Khalifa al the I, who was a very renowned physician he was present there and all of these people testify that the promised Messiah was lying on his bed and he would go in and out of a state of 
unconsciousness. And whenever he would wake up, he would ask the question that, is it time for prayer? Mm. And the promised Messiah would, on lying on his bed, make the actions to begin his prayer, and then he would go into a state of unconsciousness again. And this happened many, many times. And it's so outstanding. There is a hadith in which the Holy Prophet wasallam has mentioned that the Messiah, when he comes, yudfanu ma'i fi qabri. He would be buried in my grave. And this is taken literally by our non Ahmadi friends, brothers and sisters. But what this hadith meant was that there would be such an extreme similarity between the promised Messiah salam, and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the master in chief, that it would be as if the second life was a manifestation, a reflection of the first life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And we see that when the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam passed away, this was his state as well. He would go in and out of a state of consciousness, and the only thing that he could remember was his beloved Lord. And he would begin praying and then go into a state of unconsciousness. So this was the pure end of that man who was the promised Messiah, the Mahdi and the Messiah of this day and age. And if the promised Messiah Islam, God forbid died of cholera, then there's another thing which refutes this allegation. The British government at the time had a law that anybody who dies of this disease, he went into a state of quarantine and they would bury him right away without permitting that body to go anywhere else. But the promised Messiah salam, upon his demise, when the death certificate was prepared, the British government allowed for the promised Messiah salam, to be transferred to Qadian because he passed away in Lahore. And this is evidence, categorical evidence of the fact that the promised Messiah salam, did not pass away in the manner that our opponents allege. There's one other thing which is briefly I would like to mention here that some of our opponents also raise this objection that God forbid the promised Messiah salam, passed away in a very inappropriate place. Well the same question goes to them. Were they there to see that happen? And who do they claim told them this? Mm -hmm. A Molvi Sahib who was present at that time? Well, did the Molvi Sahib see this happen? God forbid if he saw this happen, if he claims that I saw the promised Messiah Islam pass away at that place, then such a ignorant man, his testimony shouldn't even be accepted because this is against the basic nobility of a human being. So I may, I'm stating this to hit home the point that these allegations are baseless, nobody has seen this happen, nobody has any proof, and then they raise these objections merely to poke fun at our beloved Master, the Promised Messiah alayhi salam. Jazakallah, Ayya Sahib, for your very comprehensive answer, and Adri Sahib, I'm sure you'll agree with me, your questions being answered both in terms of the reflections on testimonies, but also for those who perhaps don't want to reflect on the family members, on, on the facts of the case, the fact that um, the promised Messiah whilst he passed away in Lahore was and then his uh, remains were transported to Qadian where he was buried. Um, our next question comes from uh, Saima Munir Saiba. Asalaamu Alaikum and uh, thank you for your question. Thank you also for your very kind comments um, about faith matters and um, indeed it's testament to not those of us just here but many people behind the cameras and you know, the production and uh, editing team as well. Um, she writes, um, continuing with the specifically about uh, the theme of Hazrat Mirza Hulam Ahmed, the promised Messiah, al Islam, on whom be peace. She says that he passed away when he was about 73 years of age. But according to a prophecy, he was given the good news that he shall live for 80 years or more. Can you please explain to me as clearly it was, inshallah, help me answer the question which others raise with me? Um, Azhar Hanif Sahib, if I could come to you with this, this is a question of numbers, I suppose, but mm -hmm. how do the two tally? Yes, you know, it's, it's in a similar fashion as what uh, Ayaz Sahib has just mentioned. You're, you're trying to find any shred of evidence to prove your position that he was a false prophet. Mm -hmm. And you'll go to any length, in fact, to pick up a smallest point, which any person would discredit in, in, a, in a court of judgment, a court of law, and use this as, a, as your main argument to, to kind of disprove him. And this is what we see here in the case of the, the age, mm -hmm. uh, where it was prophesied he would live to a certain age, and some claim he didn't fulfill this prophecy. Thus, it proves that he made false false uh, prophecies and false claims and, and cannot be a messenger of God. 
at the same time, as, as Ayah Sahib has said, you know, if you think about it, going back to even the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he used numbers to refer to the ages of a prophet before him, Hazrat Jesus, Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, and said that Hazrat Isa alayhi salam will live to 120 years. And another hadith was quoted also, it could have been 125 years. So even in the hadith of the Holy Prophet Muhammad so I'm talking about Prophet Isa, very interesting. You know, it's both of these narrations about a prophet whose span of life is being questioned. And Prophet Muhammad so some talks 120 years, 125 years. So there's a five year difference between his prophecy. And here in this prophecy is talking again about a certain span of life. So if you're going to use this as a basis of discrediting or disproving a prophet, we would be in a position as Muslims to have to say it also disproves the prophet of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu who also used numbers which weren't always the same. Why does it happen? It could be for two reasons. That number one, we are looking at it from only the perspective of the solar years and saying now these two numbers are not matching up. So there's a discrepancy here, when in fact one could be referring to a lunar year, as which is often the case in, in the Muslim world. We base our history, our dating on the time of the Hijrat, the migration of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from Mecca to Medina. So that's called the Hijri calendar, and most of the dates in Islam are based on that. It's a lunar cycle, which is always a few days less each year than the solar cycle. And then if you go and calculate according to the solar cycle, you get a different date altogether. And thus, when we look at the age of the Prophet Messiah, you will find that the dates of his solar years will always be different than the dates of the lunar year. And prophecy is often given, as I say, in the dates of the lunar year. So I will read out the wording of this prophecy, and we can look at it from this perspective and perhaps make a little more sense out of it as to why there's nothing here open to objection. Mm -hmm. In one of his prophecies, it says, God speaks to him now. Again, this is a proof of his sincerity that these cannot be coming from him because a man who is trying to forge the numbers and, and, and trying to fabricate a, a statement he's going to be very meticulous about every single statement make sure they always line up but a man who's sincere he just said God said this to me and I'm saying it to you why that'll come I'll mention in a minute but he says in one, one of his narrations God speaks to him says you will live up to the age of 80 or near to it so the first age we have is 80 years of age then in another one of the revelations he, he receives from Allah, it says 80 years or four or five years, more or five, four or five years less. So again, it's, uh, it's you say, give or take. Yeah. And this is normal in most languages. You say, uh, uh, how old is your, your so-and-so child? A, 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 husband, a father may say, uh, he's about 14 or 15. Oh, don't you know? Or oh, my wife knows. Let me call her in a second. You see? <laughs> you know, and then sometimes you just forget the, the, the numbers. It's, it's, it's a give or take. Mm -hmm. But in this case, we can never say that God is speaking in a give and take that he doesn't know. Mm -hmm. God definitely knows the reality of this. So now we must research to figure out what could have happened. And as we as a Jamaat have been put upon uh, or been put into this position to have to prove that there's nothing here of, of a uh, discrepancy. We researched this fact very uh, carefully, and this is what uh, Simon should know, that the research has been done to prove when he was born and when he died. And look at the two dates. Research of the Jamaat has proven that he was born in the year 1835. Yes. And this will correspond to the Hijri month of 1250 Hijri. Mm -hmm. And the research again proves, and there's not much to discredit this or anyone who will look in, into the, the facts that's given. There's one encyclopedia, I believe, that says he was born in 1839. But again, why that happens, I mean, I, I lived in Pakistan for some years. The dating of birth records and death records is not the same as you find nowadays in the West. Mm -hmm. Going back even 100 years, probably even here in the, in the West, you had problems <coughs> knowing when someone was born and someone died. And they, they use uh, contemporary events, oh, he was born in the year of so-and-so, the year when this thing happened, or, or around this time. And this is how people would, would date it. And so even he himself, the Prophet Islam, sometimes would say, I was born in this certain year, and my age was about this. And on the occasion, he would say, I was born around this time, and my age was this. And there may have been a difference, but again, he's just guesstimating, as we say. He's not giving exact figures, but he's using his judgment based on that system that was prevalent then in determining age. And yet we have gone back and done, we have done the dating based on his sound statements 
using the credible research that's available uh, based on those statements. And one of them showed for sure that he was born in 1835 and he died in 1908. Now I say you do the math. Anyone who does the math comes and says that's 73 years. Mm -hmm. You're still two years short at best because it says 80 years, four or five years, more or less, which should have been 75 to 85. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But here he's going to 73 years. So what's the difference? The difference is if you look at it from, again, the lunar calendar, he's born in the year 1250 and he passes away in the year 1326. 1326 minus 1250 comes to 76 years, which is quite clear. Exactly what Allah subhanahu wa was talking about in, in, in the revelations to him is exactly what's happened. And this was for the way of our knowledge that when God speaks, he speaks in truths. He doesn't speak in ambiguities. He doesn't create confusion in his word. But we sometimes misunderstand or misconstrue his statements and therefore we start to think this is something here or we can latch on to to prove this man was false. And the, the last point I'll, I'll raise, again I found it quite striking when I, I thought about this, that the same thing has happened with the Prophet Jesus, the Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, about his own birth and his death. Mm -hmm. There's exactly five years or so difference between what they have proven now to be his actual birth and what the Kalans have always said is his birth. So it's really quite interesting to see that these two prophets who are, are the messiahs of the age, their birth was also a, a four or five year difference based on what people thought and also his death naturally would be the same. They thought he died when he was about 30 years of age but actually it's a little bit later when you calculate in the fact that he was born four or five years later than they thought he was. So that was quite striking to me when I actually thought about these two prophets and the issue of their birth and their death. One thing I'd like to ask those people who raise these questions is that if you have rejected a person on this basis, mm. if it can be proven that your objection was wrong, does that not mean that now you have to accept him even at least to that degree? Mm. So do you not have the nobility at least to come forward and say, well, I'm sorry I was wrong yes. and I admit it. Right. And because I rejected him on that basis, now that basis isn't there, I've been proven mm -hmm. that, you know, that it wasn't like that. Therefore, I have to ac accept him. Will they do that? Yes. This but is they don't. This is the problem. Mm -hmm. They'll run off to something else. Well, hopefully some, some will. Some this, will. This is why this, these are good questions to be asked yeah. in this program. People who listen, who may there have not have heard people. both sides. They've not heard both sides. There and they can judge. This yeah. is the thing. The ones yeah. who raise the objections themselves sometimes even accept Except, but uh, at least the ones who you know can, who can judge the, you know what's right and what's wrong, they can see where the truth lies. And sometimes it's just these small matters which often result in that decision being taken. So uh, as a sub and of course Jungir sub as well, Zakumla for your question. And I suppose um, Saima Saiba, it's um, uh, coming back to the point Jahangir Khan Saib's raised. Perhaps that's the question uh, you can raise with the friend who's been raising these questions with you. Um Allah for your question. Um, the next question we have is from Mansoor Ahmad Sharma Sahib. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, Mansoor Sahib, um, Jazakumullah for your question. He's talking about um, some institutions which operate within the Amdiya Muslim community, but they're basis, their foundation is in Islam. And he refers to the procedures of what's known as the basics of Majlis Ashura. There's two elements to this question, first of all. The first one, perhaps, Jahangir Khan Sahib, if I could start with you, is what is the procedural basics of what's known as Majlis Ashura? And perhaps for the benefit of our viewers not familiar with the terminology, you could define that as well. Um, well, the, base, the basis of uh, the Shura is obviously in the life of the, Prophet, the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself, so. where he was ordered by God to actually uh, seek counsel from his followers and he was told shawirhum fil amr so you have to ask them their opinions about certain things but also god told him that if you have then made your mind up then you take you make your decision irrespective of what they've decided or what they've proposed so sometimes the holy prophet muhammad so most often actually he would uh, accept the counsel coming from his followers and follow you know uh, you know align himself with that but at others, he would totally, you know, go the the other way. Everybody would be on one side, and he would be on the other. And he was always proven right in the end. You know that he he took the right decision. There were certain instances of that during his life. Um, but um, the, the the shura itself, in the beginning, you can say it was at an embryonic stage, and it was something, you know, which was just happening. 
where, for example, there would be a group of people present and then the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would just ask them, you know, what do you think about this or that? So consultation was the... It was main. consultation, mm -hmm. yes. Seeking mm -hmm. counsel from them, their mm -hmm. advice, you know. Everyone has advice according to their own mm -hmm. uh, spheres of activity and experience. But sometimes, for certain, as time progressed as well, we'd see that when the community was becoming more consolidated and more organized, then he would sometimes call certain Sahaba and even some of his wives as well. He would ask them in particular for advice on certain is issues. That would not necessarily be for the whole community to find out and they would only know what his decision was uh, when it was going to be implemented. Um, so this was uh, the basis, you can say, of, uh, of, of that, of the shura. And it also shows the humility of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Of course he was ordered to do that. But of course if he had been, Naudhu Billah Min Dalik, an imposter, who had in invented this religion, why would he have imposed that upon himself? Mm -hmm. He would have be been happier to be a dictator and to say that you just do what I tell you and you know that's it, as most people who invent religions do. They are, you know, want to do this. But he imposed uh, as if this shura upon himself, so that shows that it was coming from, from on high, actually. Um, so in the, our Jamaat now, now uh, you know, it's our, our turn to, to come onto, in, onto the pages of history, we have followed the very same principle. And because by now, of course, the community is very well organized, and even in, within our own community, with t time, as time has gone, gone, you know, gone by, we have become increasingly organized. The Majlis Shura is now a very well organized institution within the Jamaat. And uh, the person who is at the head of it all is the Khalifa of the time. But there are shuras which happen in every country as well on the national level, where different uh, uh, issues are, are, are discussed. And uh, it, it, there we have the representatives of different uh, local jamaats, for example, who are, who are present. There is also a representation of the Lajna Ima Illa, which is uh, the, the ladies' auxiliary organization. Mm -hmm. And so they all participate in this to, to put some proposals forward for the Khalifa of the time to approve. And uh, it, it, sometimes there is an international shura as well. It doesn't always take place. It's only when there is a need for it to take place that it actually occurs. But this is uh, very much you know, the way it goes about. And it's, it's very well uh, organized. Everything is you know, laid down. The, the instructions are there for everyone to, to see. And uh, it's a very beautiful process. Coming back to the shura though, if I may, you mentioned the auxiliary organizations. And of course, they themselves also conduct their own um, Majlis Ishura consultations which act in the same way. What Mansur Saab is also asking, he then reverts back to the time of the Holy Prophet of Islam, Muhammad. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he said that at that time that the Holy Prophet's peace be upon him's method was that he took mashfara, i.e. he consulted everyone. He then asked that why does that not be replicated or why is that not replicated in the procedures of the Amdiya Muslim community? Today? Well, there were was, there was several things which have to be said here. Number one, it, it did not and it cannot happen that all Muslims in existence at any point in time could give their opinions on any matter. Even at the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu there were some Muslims who did not live in Medina. There were some in the Yemen, there were some in other places. And how could they have been asked for any, any sort of advice? They weren't being asked. And so now we have 1.6 or 1.7 billion Muslims in the world. I hope that the person here, is, the questioner is not suggesting that we should ask every single person, you know, every Tom, Dick and Harry among all the Muslims in the world, what their opinion is about certain issue. Because if you have to go through even half a million uh, opinions, we, we won't get anywhere. We won't be able to do anything. So that's, that's, that, that never happened and it will never happen. Uh, what happens is, as I had said, certain pe people were present on certain occasions and so the Prophet ﷺ asked them, incidentally they happened to be there, so he asked them their, you know, what their opinion was on, on this issue or that. But on other occasions he actually called people to come and ask them the, uh, for their advice and to consult them. And we know, for example, this, this continued even after him, in the case of uh, Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu. He did not allow certain Sahaba to leave Medina even, because he wanted their advice on, on different issues. So they had to stay with him. But that also shows that because he didn't ask all the Sahaba to stay with him, that all their opinions also were not necessary. He needed some uh, uh, opinions. And uh, finally, we see another example from his life. Uh, which has to do with the election of the, the next uh, Khalifa. 
before he passed away, he actually entrusted the task of choosing the next, of, of proposing the name for the next uh, Khalifa rather, to six people. It was a small committee of six people who deliberated on this, on this subject and came forward with the name of, of uh, Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu anhu. And that later on was announced to the people and they all approved of it. But that is not to say that they were all consulted and they were all asked for their opinion. As I said, it, it couldn't physically happen even. It wasn't possible. So it didn't happen then, it doesn't happen now, nor can it. Jazakallah. Uh, Hazrat Sahib, yeah, I, and as you pick up, perhaps you can also reflect on the fact that the, the people who are represented at the Shura, yes. how they themselves find themselves in yes, that position. Yes. And I think this is the very important point I want to also add to yeah. this, this discussion. Because, in fact, the Jamaat Ahmadiyya does empower every single individual in the Jamaat to have a voice. Mm -hmm. This is very unique in our organization. Any person who is part of this organization and participates fully is recognized with a right that annually when the, a meeting takes place, you are in your local uh, congregations or jamaats as we say, you have an election meeting to select the person rep to represent you. And that representative then goes forward and carries with him the responsibility of the opinions of all those who he represents, like any system of parliament or democracy. He is your voice. But not only is he your voice, every single person in that gathering has the right to submit their proposal, their mushroom right there in that meeting, and he must carry it forward to the National Assembly. And they can then carry that forward to the international body, which is where the Khalifa sits. So in fact, what, you were, what we're saying, this is that organization where any person, man or woman, young or old, as long as they're participating, their voice can be heard by the Khalifa of the time, and their proposal can be accepted. Just as in the case of the early Muslims where one Sahabi, he saw a dream, he, saw the, he heard words of Dizan and the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam selected his opinion and this day up to now we are using those words of, of Dizan. That's how powerful the system still exists in Jamaat Ahmadiyya. Every single person still has a voice and every single person in a sense can't go to that meeting but their voice, their opinions can reach it through the system of this organization. And there's one I suppose just I suppose comparing it to some other legislative systems that the Shura has that it doesn't allow for the right of abstention so you either are for something or against something but yes, yes. and it empowers you if you're entrusted to make a decision then you're asked to make it. That's right it's complete honesty you mm. must weigh things and choose the best of all options and that means once it's chosen however even if it wasn't your opinion your option you accept it as if it was your own you embrace it for the sake of the the common unity and good and that's again a, a beautiful system where you don't have these competing parties trying to pull someone down uh, because their their view went forward or their group went forward and not your view and not your group it, it is now again unity after the decision the quran makes it very clear to the Prophet. Once you have taken the mushroom, now you make a decision and trust in God and everyone should follow along with that decision. And another aspect is that there is no seek there aren't any secret ballots as well. Everything is done above board. Mm -hmm. So if you vote, everyone sees who's voting for what. And uh, as Azhar Saab said, then afterwards, even if that was not your proposal that was elected, which was uh, put through, you take it as if it was your own. That's a very a, a great beauty of the system, actually. Jazakumullah, Nihangir Saab, Azhar Saab, for your answers then. Mansur Saab, I trust your question's been answered. And for all our viewers, if you've got any comments, thoughts, or observations on what you've heard today so far or on any other issue, you know what to do. The email address is faithmatters at mta.tv. That's faithmatters, one word, at mta.tv. And a reminder of the facts once again, 44 for the UK, 208-687-8037. Um, we're going to travel to Azhar Saab's uh, country for the next one. Um, and it's from Haris Ahmed from California in the United States. Assalamu alaikum Haris Sahib. Jazakumullah for your question. Um, the, he talks about the growth of the Amdiya Muslim community and how many people have joined the community over um, the years since its establishment. And he asks that, again, I suppose this is one of the questions which is raised by people from outside the Amdiya Muslim community, that, you know, and it's something which a lot of people talk about, how much do you, how many do you number? Yasab, if I could start with you as well, that obviously the Amdiya Muslim community represents a renaissance of Islam, it's a growing number, and as evidence has shown over recent years, you know, every day, 
new members are joining the Amdiya Muslim community, the Renaissance of Islam. Do we and can we and at any time, you know, put exact numbers because people talk of this million, that million, and I suppose what Haris Saab is actually getting to, that this is something that's raised with him repeatedly. Mm. This is also an allegation which is often raised by uh, certain uh, people to prove that uh, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community is a cult and it deceives people and it gives figures which are not true and it deceives the world and mm -hmm. all of these things are attributed to the community and it is asserted that if the figures which are given by the Ahmadiyya Muslim community in certain countries is correct then every fourth or fifth person in that country should be an Ahmadi mm -hmm. and this proves that God forbid this is not a true community my question is what difference does it make when we analyze the truthfulness of a prophet do we ask that prophet or that saint to first give us the record of his murids or his followers and then decide whether that person is truthful or not so humbly I think this is a non-issue because it doesn't in any way prove or disprove that ideology, that teaching, <coughs> that beautiful wisdom which the promised Messiah brought in the latter days in the form of true Islam. But even still, if we are to take up this issue, the fact of the matter is that if and before I go on, I would also like to ask that if it is proven, is there any benchmark? If it is proven that the Ahmadiyya Muslim community has this many people, then it will be deemed a truthful community. And if it has less than that, then it will not. As a matter of fact, the Holy Quran states that this is a sign of divine communities, that they start off in a state of weakness. They're usually the minority, but their work is so powerful with the succor and help of Allah the Almighty, that that minority moves mountains that minority does such work which the majority cannot even do and this is which we see we see this in the life of the holy prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and we see this very humbly i would say in the Ahmadiyya Muslim community as well. The work which are, we are doing is not hidden from anyone. Mm -hmm. Everybody sees that. The development of schools, hospitals, humanitarian services, the chanda which is collected by our Ahmadiyya Muslim community which opponents once again raise an allegation against. That very chanda is to such a level that the Ahmadiyya Muslim community is able to feed thousands and thousands and millions of hungry people. We create model villages in Africa for people who don't have electricity. So all of these services are being done. That should be paid attention to as opposed to playing a number game. Merely as Azhar Sahib was saying, if I can't grasp anything else, let's catch something to prove that these people are false. This is not the attitude of a believer. But if we look at the manner in which the Ahmadiyya Muslim mm -hmm. community gets baths and people come into the fold, it's no different than in the time of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It is proven that from the books of Sirat, the life history of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, that a delegation would come to Medina and analyze the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's claim. And if the chieftain would accept the message, then he would give his bath for all of the people of his tribe, and they would all be included as Muslims. So too is the case with Ahmadiyya as well. When we go to different countries, especially in Africa for example, a chief of the tribe accepts and then an average figure of their entire tribe is considered to be a part of the fold. Now the question that, so these are always approximate numbers, we never give an exact number that this is the amount because there was no bath forms in the time of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam but I don't hear any of the kuffar ever raising this objection, God forbid the disbeliever said that well Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is false because we don't have any record of his baths. So it's a non-issue once again I'm stressing. Then the other issue which is also important is that when people come into the fold there's a process of training. <laughs> People accept Ahmadiyyat, but then slowly, slowly, they start developing an attachment with the community. They are, their knowledge increases, they are made aware of the institutions of the Jamaat. Then slowly and gradually, they become active members of the community. Therefore, that's why you see this gradual process of increase. So although those people would be considered as Ahmadis, but they don't become active Ahmadis until this training process reaches a certain level, where then they become active members of the community. And in addition to that, we also have to take into account that certain people leave the community as well. 
And this is something which is tied to divine communities. Before somebody sends us another question to Faith Matters, to say that Ahmadiyya is false because people leave the community. This happened in the time of the Holy Prophet Muhammad wasallam as well. When Moses Islam went to the mount, people began to worship the calf. So this fluctuation always takes place. But the majority you will see of Ahmadis remain firm Ahmadis. And they offer sacrifices as they are doing in various countries for the sake of Ahmadiyyat. The number of people which leave the community, the divine communities of Allah the Almighty, are very few. And there's another thing as well. Hidden. Certain contacts come into the Ahmadiyya community and then slowly because no contact is made with them, they remain dormant, they remain idle. They consider themselves to be Ahmadis, but they don't become active. And Hazure Anwar, the head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, the fifth successor of the Promised Messiah every year in his second day address on Saturday, announces the number of renewed contacts which were achieved that year, of people who were already Ahmadi, but because of the lack of resources to contact them in their remote villages, we weren't able to bring them into the community as active members. So this all also adds to the fluctuation and Hazur Anwar Ayyadahullah Ta'ala bin Asil Aziz every year also in his Friday sermon addresses the community, the whole world in fact, and speaks about the growth of Chanda as well. At the end of every fiscal year, Hazur announces the amount of increase which took Chanda place, Chanda, the contributions the which are done by the, Muslim, the members of the community. Mm -hmm. And for example, this year, for Tahrik e Jadid, which is a scheme by which the foreign missions are run of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community and services are done in foreign countries outside of the subcontinent, Hazur mentioned that the increase was about 1.12 million pounds. And that's from the whole world. And keeping in mind the economic crisis, people aren't getting richer. So either that means two things. Either the numbers of people are growing, which is a credit to the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, or it proves that the people who are already in the community, if hypothetically we accept that there was no additions, that means that the level of their contributions were increasing. And that in itself is truthfulness of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, that you have such selfless souls who are willing to give everything for the sake of their beloved Khalifa. I suppose there's that simple phrase, isn't it? Look at the quality rather than the quantity, and therein you will probably, hopefully, inshallah, find the truth. Um, but Jazakumullah, Haris Saab, um, for your question, and uh, Jazakumullah to Ayaz Memun Khan Sahib for his answer. Um, the next one question we're going to take, you know, we're going to stay in North America and Canada, is from Dr. Muhammad Sadiq Pudan Sahib. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Sahib. Once again, thank you for your question. Um, he relates to the, or mentions the verse of the Holy Quran, uh, chapter 2, verse 257, which says there is no compulsion in religion. And then he takes that as the base of his question and says that he still finds that if you take the example of countries such as Pakistan, there some citizens are threatened with punishment unless they reject uh, what he terms the unity of Allah and the prophethood of Hazrat Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he says that you also find certain high-profile ulamas uh, who argue in favor <coughs> of the death penalty for those who dare to leave Islam. What is the Amdiya Muslim position on this? Well, I, I think that we have <coughs> answered this question quite a number of times. But I'm sure because of what continues to happen in the Muslim world, the question arises again and again. Because no matter how many times we say this, the argument is that that is your view, but the reality is something different. Why is it that you continue to say that the Holy Quran has given a complete declaration of freedom of conscience? La ikraha fideen. There is absolutely no compulsion either to believe in something or to be forced to not believe in something. Both ways goes. So if you are a believing Christian in a land, I can neither force you to be a Muslim, nor can I force you not to be a Christian. That is your right. This is what we always have been saying over and over again, the justification for jihad, which for 13 long years in Mecca wasn't any reality because the Muslims were under the persecution themselves and they were suffering the fact of loss of their right, their freedom of conscience. And yet, the entire time of this suffering, the Prophet Muhammad was asked on some occasions, should we fight them back? 
for this right. You are a prophet of God, and God stands with you. We, we see how much God loves you and supports you. Just give us the command, O messenger, and we will fight them right now. And he kept telling him, no, you have not been given the right to fight. And I have not been sent here, but as a mercy for people, not to destroy people. So show patience as so many groups before you showed patience. However, there's always a threshold, there's always a stream limit to which even God says, I won't allow this to go on any further because if I don't intervene now, and I've been very patient with, with, the, with human affairs here, I've allowed them to work it out themselves in the course of human intercourse. But if they cannot prevent, or if they cannot stop the injustice against one group to another, then I intervene and I give the group the right of taking life, if necessary, to defend this conscience, which is greater than anything else, mm -hmm. the freedom of conscience. He was then in Mecca and Medina given the right to fight. Prior to that, there was no question in his mind or there was no action that we can use as justification to prevent someone from believing some way or to force someone to believe something else. It was only in Medina and that right was based on a clear command that you will fight not just for the Muslims, for the mosques, you will fight for the churches, you will fight for the synagogues, you will fight for every person anywhere who has a belief because you know what it means. And the Muslim who, who thinks this, they should, they should also realize that we should know what it meant to have been deprived that right. How much the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallam suffered, I mean, his, lost his family, his loved ones in front of him, his own people were dragged to the streets of Mecca, they, were, they suffered so much. And we all recount this history and sometimes with tears in our eyes and moving the congregation with all the emotions and then we turn around and say, but you know that church next door, you know, we should burn it down because they have no right to live, you know, they, they're not Muslims. And we'll do the same thing to them which we just read about happened to our messenger uh, of Islam, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is what really is often overlooked. The justification of fighting in Islam was only given to defend conscience every human being's conscious to believe, to profess, profess, practice, and even preach whatever they wish, or the right not to believe, or then also the right to change belief. There was, I'll end with this because I'm, I think my colleagues may have some other points to raise, but there was even one uh, companion who was given the charge of a small child who wasn't a Muslim. And he asked the Messenger of Allah that should I raise him as a Muslim? And he was told no. He was not born a Muslim. He was born, I believe it was a Christian home. You may correct me in this tradition. Uh, and he said raise him according to the tradition which he was born in. That is how much he respected human conscience. That this is a child who's innocent. You have no right to interfere with him. If he then in his own conscience getting old, has maturity, has the capacity to analyze things, and wants to change his faith, then fine, that's up to him. But you cannot even interfere with the, the faith of a child and force him to be what you want because he has no rights. This is the beauty of Islam, which they, they've lost sight of in this day and age, unfortunately. So we continue to say that this is what it is, but they continue to do what they do in Pakistan and other places, not just in Pakistan, I, don't, I won't single them out. This is happening in many parts of the world and even many parts of the non Muslim world where they are also trying to force you not to be something or force you to be something. So it, it goes many ways, but this right was established by the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for everyone across the board. It was a right, universal right, as he was a uni universal messenger. So everyone, whether they are Muslim or Christian or Jewish or whatever, they should honor this Prophet for the great service and sacrifices he made to uphold the freedom of human conscience. It's a, it was a tremendous service to, to humankind, and we should recognize that across the board. And I suppose uh, ultimately, just because someone says you aren't something or you are something, that doesn't make you that person. It is ultimately God who judges, and that's the, and the Muslim viewpoint on, on all faiths. Zakamullah, as I said, for your answer there, and uh, Dr. Saab, uh, thank you once again for your question. Um, we seem to have, we're on the run here of uh, North America. We've got a, we're going to stay in uh, Canada, Toronto, for the next question from Kashif Mahmoud Sahib. Assalamu alaikum, Kashif Saab. Again, as others viewers are as well, thank you for your kind words about faith matters. Um, his question relates to 
cures in the Quran and by this the sort of the power of Quranic verses and the cures that they could bring and there are traditions of prayers being said to cure person when perhaps um, actual medicine has not been administered perhaps there are examples of that as well and uh, Jahangir Khan Sahib if I could come to you with this he says that some people say there is a cure in the Quran um, I believe there is a cure in the Quran but it's not one which is spiritual I do not know if a physical cure can happen by reading selected verses of Quran so it's taking the spirituality and the strength of prayers alone to cure something and he's actually saying is that possible without a physical cure also being present? It, it might seem very, you know, hocus pocus to people these days because they, they certainly don't believe in just reciting things and then people getting better, etc. Having said that, there, was, there are several studies which were carried out very recently and I think they're probably still carrying them out now. Uh, the results of which were quite interesting where they showed that certain people who were uh, suffering from different diseases in hospital and who were being prayed for were showing marked um, responses to their treatments uh, as uh, opposed to those who weren't being prayed for. And it didn't make any difference whether they were informed that they were being prayed for or not. And that was the interesting thing which intrigued the scientists who were actually carrying out these tests. And they showed that um, people who actually prayed themselves as well, while they were praying, there were certain ac um, areas of the brain which became activated, which were not activated when they weren't praying. And so they're intrigued by the whole phenomenon, and there's definitely a scientific basis to it. Now, having uh, said that, as a kind of a background to, to what I wanted to say on this question, um, we, ha we find thousands and thousands of examples of people having been cured by Quranic verses. Um, which were recited to them prayerfully by saints of the past. There are so many examples and they're really wonderful and marvelous examples uh, ex you know, of uh, people who were pronounced you know, incurable by, by the, med the, the medical um, you know, body of the time, uh, the doctors, etc., but who then miraculously regained their health. And the, the Jamaat Ahmadiyya, alhamdulillah, is also full of such uh, examples to this day but uh, in particular at the time of the Promised Messiah himself and his companions, there were so many examples of this that we really can't deny it, the, the effectiveness of the verses. Having said that, it also stands to reason that this is not for everybody to do. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that every person has the, 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 the knowledge of how to use which verse, etc. And how, you know, has the depth, perhaps spiritual depth, to actually make it become effective in that particular way. And we see that certain people seem to have been granted specific capacities by God as well. You know, di different believers have different capacities and some of them seem to kind of specialize in, you know, curing people with their, their, their uh, Quranic prayers. Um, but there's one um, a very uh, interesting um, reference in the Haqqaiq uh, al-Furqan, which are notes on the Holy Quran, written by the first caliph. Uh, Maulvi Hakim Nuruddin Sahib Radhiallahu Anhu, the first caliph after the Promised Messiah and on page 587 in the original in Urdu uh, you can see that he writes about the, uh, Surah an -Nas. so that, it's at the very end of, the, of his book and um, he says in that, he writes that in my opinion there is a cure as in the form of a prayer in Surah an -Nas, which is the final chapter of the Holy Quran for diseases which relate to the lungs he said, for example, consumption of the lungs, cough, coughing, etc., etc. And uh, he said that um, uh, the, the wording of, the, of the, the, the Quran in that particular surah, it has to do with al-jinna, min al-jinnati wa nas. There's something happening in the sudur in nas, in the, you know, the, which, which means the breast of, of, man, of man, mm -hmm. meaning the lungs as well. And he said, jinna can also mean germs because they are invisible things and as we know from the study of the hadith jinn and, and also the Quran the word jinn or jinna can also refer to uh, bacteria or to viruses and uh, so he said that th there is something very potent in this uh, uh, surah which if used correctly could cure the person suffering from such diseases and he even goes so far as to say that the, the ma'alij and the timardar who are going to visit, meaning the people who are trying to treat this person medically, 
uh, or the visitors who are coming to, you know, to, to inquire about uh, the person's health, they should all pray this surah, recite this surah, in view of, uh, of uh, curing the person of the particular disease which has to do with his lungs. So that's a quite, a, quite an interesting insight which he gave. But as I said, there were thousands upon thousands of such instances within our own literature, first of all, but even in the, the literature of Islam of the past, prior to the coming of the Imam Hadi al-Islam, I mean by that. And uh, I think it would be quite interesting for people to actually go and uh, you know, find out a little bit more about this. But we have to remember, as I said, it's not for everybody to be able to use them correctly. It doesn't mean that somebody could just you know, could make a collection of all these prayers and just start dispensing them you know, left, right and center. That would be a mockery of the whole thing. What's needed is spirituality, sincerity, and a, a real profound feeling of sympathy for the person who's suffering, whether it's for yourself, or more so, of course, for, the, for another person. That's, that is required for it, of course. Exactly. Yasab, if I could just come to you very briefly on this as well. I mean, one of the things which quite often we hear, the mother's prayer for a child, for example, you know, that the prayer said from the heart with such purity and without any, you know, limits is said and quite often within uh, Islam and within Muslims you find certain prayers are said and people will say that prayer about a child, a mother, as, as I said validity of that and proof of that? Well there is proof of that. You see the promised Messiah والسلام, in his book Barakatul Dua or the blessings of prayer has mentioned this very point. He has said that people they accept the qualities and the effectiveness of uh, physical medicines but they don't believe in the spiritual medicines of Allah the Almighty. And he has drawn a parallel between the physical world and between the spiritual realm. And he says that these both, these two different realms run in parallel to one another. And just how a medicine can be uh, effective, a spiritual prayer is much more effective than that. Because the Promised Messiah in that book goes on to say that there are certain factors which Allah the Almighty puts into play when a person makes a prayer. But as Jahangir Sahib was saying, it's very important that that prayer should be sympathetic, it should be sincere, it should be from the depths of a person's heart because if it's if if even a thief could take a verse of the Holy Quran and start dispensing them as Jahangir Sahib was saying it would make a mockery of the thing. Spiritual power is there but it requires a spiritual person to use those things. There's an instance from the time of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where a, a group of companions went to a certain and chieftain and they wished to uh, ask something of him but he refused and then later he was bitten by a snake and he called upon those companions to see whether they could help him and uh, the companions went to him and they used Surah Al-Fatiha which is the opening chapter of the Holy Quran and blew onto his snake bite and he was cured and when they were, came back to Medina and this was reported to the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he was very happy his, his face sh became radiant and he said how did you find out that Surah Fatiha has a curing uh, uh, capability and he said that well I thought that this is a prayer and if it is administered as a prayer then it would do its wonders and the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam affirmed this so so too is the case with a prayer of a mother or any other sincere person Jazakumullah and of course Jahangir Sahib for your answers there on prayers and uh, their effectiveness and um, we're into the sort of last throws of the program but we'll take I think one more question and for this we'll go to Adnan Ahmed Lake Sahib's question he's based in India Asalaamu Alaikum Adnan Sahib and thank you very much for your question his question is confession allowed in Islam as part of righteousness um, <clears throat> he talks about publishing of sins which we have committed even with our loved ones I suppose in part as I say, if I could come to you with this, it relates to, I suppose, the, the confessional elements of Catholicism, for example, that we see people going to churches and you know, confessing their sins and then being told what they need to do. Mm -hmm. Does such a thing exist in Islam or is confession part of righteousness? Yes. Well, uh, although Adnan appears to be from India, and I, I can't assume he's not of a Christian background or, or he doesn't know of the Christian uh, teachings and theology, 
where people are saying, well, why in Islam you don't have a system where you can go and absolve yourself of sins and confess your sins in front of someone. And, and perhaps even some Muslims may, may be appearing to do that when they go to certain sites, the grave sites. And it, 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 so many things are happening, so it may convey, convey uh, uh, the impression that we have a system of confession in Islam, openly in public. But in fact, there's a tradition of the Holy Prophet Muhammad that very clearly says that no Muslim should do this because it's against divine grace and mercy, and the attribute of always God wanting to cover up the sins of man. Now, we are born with a weakness in, in Arabic terms is called dhanb. Dhanb in Arabic means something that attaches to the person, like a tail attaches to the, the monkey. And, and it's something you can't get away from. Every single human being has this, these shortcomings and weaknesses. And thus we always pray as whether we are committing a sin or not in a sense. We're confessing to Allah subhanahu wa our weakness, our shortcoming, our potential human capacity to err by saying Astaghfirullah Rabbi min kulli dhanbin Oh Allah, I seek your protection from every potential sin and I turn myself toward you and, and turning toward you to seek your help that I may not slip and fall into error and that's the extent of anything public we would say regarding a confession of our weaknesses and sins but the actual admission of sin is actually strongly uh, discouraged and almost condemned in Islam, I'll, I'll relate to you this one tradition which speaks to this very clearly. Hazrat Abu Huraira I hope Allah be pleased with him reports that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Prophet Muhammad said, all of my community will be excused or pardoned except those who are blatant. And it is from being blatant to perform an act at night and to wake up and tell, some, tell something that they did or tell someone that they did such and such. So he's saying in fact that you have a cloak of security around you, mm -hmm. a shield more or less. And if this idea of at night time you committed something doesn't mean at night, it could be the day, it could be whatever. But God is always concealing the errors of human beings. In fact, we don't know what anyone is doing unless, they, for, for the most part, they tell us or they've done it so openly and so you know, callously that it, it becomes a crime that man can find out. And, and so he's saying that you should be very careful because God is always covering up the things you've done. And he will always do that except for the one who then goes and, goes and tells someone, you know last night or you know yesterday or he begins to tell people and you say, my God, why are you revealing what God has, has covered up? So he says in the end of the hadith that, and it is from blatancy to perform an act and to wake up and tell someone that it is such and such while Allah had concealed it for them. God had concealed it and yet you are going to reveal it. Does that make any sense? Would you tell me that I have a treasure buried in my yard here every whole, the whole, whole world come and look? In the same way, you're not going to tell me I have all the dead bones of the people I killed in the last 20 years in my, in my yard as well. You're not going to do either of these things because you know it's going to bring a certain reaction from the public. And at the end of this he said, they slept under the cover of Allah and they rendered Allah's covering from themselves in the morning. Again, the issue is not morning and night, it's the fact that you have revealed what God wishes to conceal and God did conceal. And this is how he says in another hadith, you go in front of Allah on the, on the last day. And in that private conversation, the person will be conversing with Allah and Allah will tell him that you commit so and so sin, so and most, so and so sins, but I kept covering them up until finally now you come in front of me and I forgive your sins, I accept your repentance and you can go into the, into the heaven. So this is the beauty of it. And lastly, the reaction, a actual reaction of someone who tries to profess and confess their sins is shown in the hadith again. A man came first to Hazrat Abu Bakr, who was to be the first Khalifa, and he confessed in this hadith very openly, he says, I have committed adultery. Astaghfirullah, we know this is, who wants to come and tell somebody you know, what they did last night or yesterday, I've committed. Hazrat Abu Bakr said to him, have you mentioned this to anyone else? And the man said no. He said, then cover it up with the veil of Allah. Allah accepts repentance from his servants. The exact same tradition which was mentioned earlier, he's repeating, educating the man. Don't tell anyone these things. Cover them up. 
even though we know that adultery in Islam is one of the heinous crimes that can be punished with severe punishment, he didn't tell them that, oh, you've done this, let it, let's punish you now. Because he knew, unless you commit it to a certain extent that's so public, it's well known, cover that up. But then the man still didn't feel comfortable. He goes on to Hazrat Umar Talanho and says to him, I committed adultery. He says the same thing. Did, did you tell anyone else? He says, no. He says, then cover it up. Finally, the man, is, he doesn't stop there. You know, whatever is wrangling his mind, you know, this is the problem of confession. It's a guilty conscience, a guilty soul that wants to relieve that burden. And you think it can be done by just confessing. Confessing doesn't relieve the burden. It actually shifts it onto someone else because now they're thinking, I thought he was such a good man. Well, he's done this. Well, I guess that's not so bad after all. I'll do it too. Or, or it begins to make it a public situation where you lose respect for that person who could have been your model. And we've heard this many times, even especially in the sports world, the sporting world, all these athletes are saying, I'm not a role model, I have nothing to, 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 to conceal, I do what I do, and no one should follow me. Well, they are following you, they emulate your actions, and you are also responsible by doing these things publicly and openly, and even saying there's nothing wrong with it. That person who's influenced by you, or potentially influenced, is, is going to fall prey to it. So, so ultimately, I suppose, in summing it up, really, is, um, you know, it's to Allah, the protector, Allah the sustainer, and Allah is the one no who is merciful sins, yes. and can forgive. Gentlemen, um, I have a confession. We've run out of time. So um, <laughs> with that, it just remains to me to thank all of you once again for your scholarly answers and, of course, viewers, to you for your questions. Without you, Faith Matters would not be the program it is. Just as a final reminder for emails and future questions, the email address here is faithmatters at mta.tv. That's faith, faith matters at mta.tv and the fax number as a final reminder, 44 for the UK, 208 687 8037. Until the next time, from all of us here in London on Faith Matters, Asalaamu Alaikum.